We're going to just take a very, very brief look at the Greek origins of philosophy. The slide shows Raphael's famous School of Athens picture, which is an idealized collection of some major figures in Greek thought at the time. You can find lots of people represented there, such as Euclid, for example. The most famous two uh, philosophers of ancient Greece occupied the central position. Those are Aristotle and Plato. Plato was the guy pointing up for he's best known for his theory of forms, which represents an abstraction away from the situated incarnate present situation. Aristotle, on the other hand, has his hand pointing down, showing he's firmly attached to the earth. Aristotle um, is often seen as the founder of empirical science in some respects. Plato and Aristotle are very conventional starting points. I want to pick out two other people from this tableau. That guy down there is Heraclitus. Uh, actually, Raphael painted his rival, Michelangelo, so it's actually a portrait of Michelangelo, but within the frame of the painting, it stands for Heraclitus, one of the pre-Socratic philosophers. And just behind him is Parmenides. And these are the two I want to single out. Um, they are from about 500 BC, so they uh, are very, very old. They predate Socrates. So they predate what we might think of as Western philosophy. Philosophy. They belong to a group known as the pre-Socratics. Um, the reason I single these two out is not because we're going to study Greek philosophy, um, but certain questions come into being around this time that we still wrestle with. Um, they provide very strongly contrasting metaphysical pictures, but they are both concerned with what we mean when we say that something exists and what the relationship of existence to time is and to the present, what it is to persist over time and what the relationship between the world as it appears to us is and as it is in itself. Heraclitus is primarily known for his emphasis on change. Everything, according to Heraclitus, is change. He saw the fundamental substance of the world as being fire, which is constantly changing. He's famous for noting that you can never step into the same river twice. And Heraclitus um, stands behind uh, an awful lot of thinking that acknowledges the um, indeterminate nature of the present, where we, in order to say anything strong about what's going on at the present, we have to more or less leave the present behind. Heraclitus has one vision and Parmenides has a very, very different, but likewise all-encompassing vision. Where Heraclitus is focused on change, for Parmenides, change is an impossibility. So Parmenides has this view of time, if you will, as a long, long line in which everything occurs and when something something so something either exists or it doesn't exist but when you lay it out like that which is a very spatial way of thinking you recognize that all you've done is draw static pictures in a four-dimensional space or some higher dimensional space so parmenides is associated very much with determinate descriptions of the state of something in time but he reached the absurd conclusion that time doesn't exist, that time is, time is not real. For Heraclitus, everything happens in the present moment. Now, we are missing a lot of their works. We only have fragments, and they wrote poetry. We, philosophy and poetry were the same thing back then. But for us, they will serve as useful landmarks, because we will often have to point to where we're talking about processes of change, things going on, and where we're talking about states, which are relatively determinate fixed entities. Heraclitus is very much aligned with the questions we'll be asking about the reality of present subjective experience, if you like, the lived now. For Heraclitus, it's always now. Um, and from Parmenides, we get this stubborn insistence that things simply exist or don't exist. And he's concerned with that which indubitably exists. Now, 
Nobody has ever managed to marry these two visions successfully. And in some sense, if you could see as Heraclitus sees and you could see as Parmenides sees at the same time, you would have a godlike vision of the world, which we unfortunately don't have. Many of the questions of mind that we will be concerned with um, gloss over this fundamental distinction between state and process. Um, the mind is in many ways a rhetorical device we use in order to link, to make the link between our view of time as, um, as a linear sequence going from the past to the future with the richness of the present. The present moment always defies description. So they set things up and we'll be playing in this playground hereafter. But we're not really concerned with the details of Greek philosophy here. So now we're going to skip about 2000 years and move up to about 1600, around the time that modern science is being built. And I apologize for skipping over so much interesting stuff that happened in between.